Yeah, and silence your phones if you have it. Still have a minute. So. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to day two of the press briefings at the 46th DPS meeting here in Tucson. Uh, my name is Dr. Vishnu Reddy. I am the DPS press officer. Uh, we have a very exciting and interesting panel today. Uh, to my extreme right, we have uh, Dr. Hakan uh, Swedem uh, of the European Space Agency. Uh, he's the project scientist for Venus Express, and he's going to talk about the uh, aerobraking campaign uh, with the Venus Express spacecraft. Uh, Next, we have uh, Candice Gray, who's a graduate student at the New Mexico State University, and she's going to talk about uh, Aurora and Venus using ground-based and uh, Venus Express data. Uh, then we have Dr. Scott Shepard. He's an astronomer at the Carnegie uh, Institution, and he's going to talk about the discovery of a very fast-moving uh, main belt comet. Uh, then you have Dr. Jian Yang Li uh, at the Planetary Science Institute, where he's a, a research scientist, and he's going to talk about Hubble observations of uh, comet sighting springs we had uh, a recent uh, brush by of uh, planet Mars. And finally, we have uh, Keegan Ryan. Uh, he, Keegan is an undergraduate at Caltech, and he's going to talk about uh, binary planets. Uh, without uh, much delay, I would invite Hawken to start the show. Thank you, Vishnu. Okay. Thank you all for coming here to... Look at this. Uh, Venus Express is, uh, as you may know, uh, uh, has been around for quite some time now. So we are now going to stress the space a bit more than we would, would have done at the beginning of the mission. So I'll just briefly uh, summarize here the main results of this, uh, of this uh, brief talk I have here. So we have uh, executed a campaign of intense air braking, uh, exposing the spacecraft to much higher than usual forces, uh, also normal, higher than normally done by air braking because of being late in the mission. No observable degradation has been found, and uh, using air braking with intense air braking rather than rocket thrusting will have significant advantages for future missions, uh, reducing the launch mass with 100 kilograms or more, depending on the size of the spacecraft. We have also characterized the atmosphere in a region impossible to probe by remote sensing. We found the atmosphere to be much more variable than expected, and the new models that we are now uh, making will be based on these data, and they will be significantly adding to the knowledge of the, of the upper atmosphere. So now going to, to Venus Express, a uh, spacecraft uh, you can see here, um, uh, with a built-in record time, that's why it's called Express, Venus Express, uh, following up to Mars Express, reusing parts of Rosetta. It was a package of three spacecraft together, of which Venus Express was the last one. Uh, launched in uh, 2005 uh, and uh, arriving in Venus 11th of April 2006. We've been there now for more than eight years, downloading more than six terabits of data, which is more than all previous missions together. Um, at Venus. So it's been a very productive mission, and as I said, we now uh, dare to take some risks to the spacecraft because we're running out of fuel. We don't know exactly how much fuel we still have left, but um, <clears throat> we have attempted this in, in June, July this year. Uh, so what is an air braking? Air braking is to use the drag of the atmosphere against the body of the spacecraft and the solar panels to reduce the spacecraft speed, and this results in a lower apocenter altitude and a shorter orbital period. Uh, the ma major factors to uh, keep in mind then is that the spacecraft need to be designed to have a stable attitude uh, to be able to, to keep that during the aerobraking phase. 
uh, it has to be withstanding the dynamic loads, and that's often seen as the most, uh, most uh, difficult things. But uh, if I can borrow a little piece of paper here, yeah. <laughs> I can, I can say that, yeah, a normal writing paper is about 80 grams per square centimeter, but if you, yes, the force you need to keep that afloat is actually already much more than the dynamic force you put on the spacecraft. So it's not very much of a dynamic force. The real thing is the aerothermal heat flux you get from the impinging molecules onto the spacecraft structure. So that's a really difficult thing. It heats up the spacecraft a lot. Oops. Um, and for this operation, also the operational aspects are very important to keep in mind because you need to go into the air braking with the correct attitude. So you don't want to go into a safe mode or something like that just before it happens. So why do we do this? <clears throat> air braking. We will learn about the atmosphere in a region which we cannot access by remote sensing techniques, uh, typically between, say, 170 and 130 kilometers. No instruments are sensitive to that uh, area, really. We will achieve in situ density profiles uh, along the orbital axis. We don't, we don't only get one point, we get the whole track, trace around the arc. Um, we will study the structure of the atmosphere along that uh, arc, and we will search for wave activity in high altitude winds. We measure with other sensors that benefit from very low altitude operation, in particular the magnetometer and energy particle measurements. In this case, uh, magnetometer, because we do want to see if there, after all, may be a weak internal field, a magnetic field of Venus that have perhaps be, be some indications for. Uh, Venus is known otherwise as a non-magnetized uh, planet, of course. And uh, the other big reason is to, uh, to reduce orbital period and upper center height of a spacecraft without using fuel, uh, because that will then allow us to allow more payload on a certain mission, or alternatively to use a smaller and cheaper launcher. So both very important points. So this graph here shows the correspondence between the orbital period and the uh, Peri pericenter velocity, because that pericenter velocity is what we are affecting by doing air braking. You can see here we're at the upper right corner, we start, we have 24 hour orbit of Venus Express, and we have a, um, a velocity at, uh, at um, pericenter when we started at about uh, 9.82 kilometers per second. So the more we reduce that, you can see here how much we are reducing the, uh, the orbital period. Now, uh, we don't do the air braking for operational reasons because we are at the end of the mission now, but we do it just for demonstrational purposes and we are stressing the spacecraft more than normal, so we were happy if we could achieve something about a one hour delay, and you can see later on that we more than well achieved that. Uh, if we would go to a, a, a more operational air braking, we perhaps wanted to, we have wanted to go to something like, uh, like 12 hour that would have requested, uh, required about 250 meters per second in total, or even only go to 18 hour would require 90 meters per second. So it means that we would have to go on for a long time because one pass doesn't give you so much. But you can see here what we would achieve then, going from 67,000 uh, kilometer at the upper center where we start, and then we're shrinking down, of course, the more we go on doing air braking. Uh, <clears throat> now, as it turned out, uh, there is a natural decay in the pericenter altitude. Uh, on this graph here, you see how that uh, behaves at the time when we placed it. Um, in, uh, in June, July, there was a sort of a plateau. You can see that between day 40 to day 75, approximately, where the de uh, altitude does not change significantly. But you can see that uh, to that point, we have a very smooth and nice uh, uh, descent, day-to-day uh, day -day, uh, uh, reduction in altitude. So now we'll go to the real results. <clears throat> you can see here the, the actual uh, altitude evolution, how we, how we dealt with it. We can see in the beginning, already at one of the days, um, in the, in the upper left corner here, we, we thought we were going down a bit too fast. We did rise the percent a bit, but then we continued along the, along the planned uh, uh, curve, and then we actually reduced it a few times at the end to finally reach an altitude of 129 kilometers, which is really a very low altitude indeed for, for doing air braking at Venus. So what do we expect? Uh, we expect to see something like a profile like, like this here, sort of Gaussian shaped profile. The time here on the x-axis is in seconds, so the whole activity is over in less than two minutes, and, uh, and uh, you can see the sort of typical Gaussian shape. So what did we get? The next slide shows one of the passes here from the 20th of June. The red curve uh, with, a, with a noisy uh, yellowish background is, is an integrated smooth curve of, uh, of the acceleration, which is directly proportional to the density of the atmosphere. Uh, the curve actually shows here sort of a, like Gaussian thing that would expect it. So nothing strange with that. The other thick red curve, it shows the delta V that you can read against the, the left uh, y-axis. And that is, of course, what we want to get as much as possible when we want to demonstrate the effect. 
Uh, another day here, three days later, you can see that the curve from the acceleration is, is stri strictly different. It has almost like two peaks and, uh, and even some substructure uh, on these peaks, uh, indicating what we do think is something like atmospheric waves at these altitudes. At, uh, I think we were at 131 kilometers at, at this time for this one. We have also a very good effect on the, on the delta V here, if you can see it's uh, approaching something like 0 0.8 meter per second for that particular pause. But now we have, for each orbit we did air braking, we have typical curves like these, and uh, th that's what we are studying to better understand uh, how the atmosphere looks like. We are summarizing here in the chart the atmospheric density as a function of, of altitude here, and you can see th there's quite some scattering, and this is a little bit surprising. You can even see here the large day-to-day -day variation we had from, from different points uh, where actually new parameters are changing, and the altitude is the same because at that time we were in this what we call the plateau, so no particular increase. And uh, this is what we're trying to understand now, which is more, more variability than we had expected, which is, of course, very interesting. We think it may be because of the wave activities. We are hitting this atmosphere in different phases of the waves. <clears throat> this is a way to, demo, to show the delta V we get uh, as a function of date. In the beginning, of course, we were still very high in, in altitude. There was no effect, but the, the more the time was going, we're going down, and we got more and more effect up to even as high as uh, 1.3 meter per second delta V at one of the passes. That's, that's indeed a very high, high number. Uh, you can see also that some of these uh, high points here were actually uh, after a date of a reduction in the pericenter. So that explains the rise, but that it then also drops afterwards. It's likely due to this aerobrake, uh, to this wave activity we see. And this is the evolution of the orbital period. Uh, as a function of, of, of orbit number here, 24 hours per orbit. We start with that here, and you can see it goes down with time, down to about 22 hours and 15 minutes when we stopped, and then we did rise per center again, and the whole air braking was over. So we clearly demonstrated the effect of the air braking here. So summarizing the results, this is ESA's first uh, air braking campaign. It was concluded with great success. The spacecraft design proved to be very robust, withstanding repeated dynamic pressures exceeding 0 0.75 newton per square meter, and this compared to the normal canonical number which is used for, for spacecraft doing air braking of 0 0.3 newton per square meter, so we really stress the spacecraft very strongly, uh, and the heat flux is uh, reached up to 7 kilowatts per square meters, uh, per meter, uh, yeah, square meter should be, not, not the second should be out there. And these are indeed record numbers. I'm not aware of any, any spacecraft that had done higher uh, loads than these. Efficiency of the air braking was clearly demonstrated, going from 24 hours to 24 hours, 15 minutes. Um, we've got the collection of atmospheric data of Venus by spacecraft tracking and by onboard accelerometers in the range from 129 to 200 kilometers, a region which is not accessible to other methods. And we have now indication of gravity waves, as I mentioned, uh, at this higher than expected altitude. We do know that we have uh, gravity waves at lower altitudes. We see it on, on, the, on the cloud cover, for example, at about 70 kilometers. Uh, we have evidence of a very strong density gradient across the day-night terminator. And we still have uh, the magnetic field data to analyze. It has not been done yet. So why is this important? We get benefits from, of course, a significantly improved modeling of that atmosphere and uh, particularly in the region uh, which is uh, between the mid-lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere in the so-called homopulse region, where the, below that region we have a complete mixing of gases, but the problem that it has a big variability depending on which gas we talk about. And of course the useful, usefulness of understanding air, air braking and saving spacecraft mass will be important for future missions and proposals, for example for the M4 proposal coming up for ESA and the discovery proposals for for in the United States, <clears throat> uh, as many of these proposals are basing actually their mission on air braking. And of course also on other planets like ExoMars on ESA is planning also to do air braking. And uh, that, that's it. We did survive this very well and now we've lifted up and uh, we'll continue the mission as long as we have, uh, uh, we have fuel left. And uh, an inherently difficult problem to measure is to measure fuel on board spacecraft. But we're going on until the bitter end. So that's, that's it, thanks.
Thank you. So my name is Candace Gray. I'm a graduate student at New Mexico State University, and I'm going to be discussing the aurora on Venus. And most people will immediately say, you can't have aurora on Venus, but I am going to argue with me and my collaborators that this actually is possible under extreme conditions, things we do not see on Earth, which allows us new ways to study chemical reactions, plasma environments that we can't generate here on Earth, and we can only get it when we look at another planet. So I would like to thank all of my collaborators. This is a very interdisciplinary project. We cannot do it without multiple people who are doing ground-based and space-based observations. So first off, what is an aurora? I'll be comparing Earth and Venus. The aurora on Earth is generated when charged particles from the sun, such as protons, electrons, get captured by the Earth's magnetic field lines, which are the blue lines you see coming in and out of Earth. They get captured, and then they get funneled onto the north and south pole, which is why you see the auroras at the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. And what happens is these charged particles impact atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, and they excite them, and then they start to emit light. And the brightest one you're going to see is green, and this comes from an atomic oxygen. There are other colors. There's reds, there's blues, there's violets. But the brightest one you're going to see is the green. Now, on Venus, we have actually seen this green emission. And uh, for shorthand, we call it the oxygen green line. But it's sporadic. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. So the immediate reaction is Venus should not have an aurora. It has no magnetic field. But we see this green emission, there are no other auroral emissions, and people have said, no, 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 it's not aurora. But we're proposing that if you have special extreme conditions, this is possible, and it's just a different chemistry than we see on Earth. And these extreme conditions that we are proposing are extreme solar events, specifically coronal mass ejections, or also referred to as CMEs, you can think of this as a solar sneeze. So the sun sends out a big sneeze, and instead of you know, germ particles, you get protons and electrons, and that goes out into space. And when that hits a planet, it's going to start igniting auroras, especially on Earth. That's when we see our brightest auroras. So we thought, OK, well, if this green that we're seeing on Venus, if it's really an auroral type thing, we should really see it bright after a coronal mass ejection impact. And that's what we started observing from the ground. So we use Apache Point Observatory. This is outside Cloudcroft, New Mexico. And you can see in the diagram we have a day side and a night side of Venus. So we focus the telescope on the night side. We do it on the edge of the planet. Because Venus doesn't have that magnetic field, the auroras will not be contained at the poles. You'll, you should be able to see it all across the night side. So this is where we looked. And sure enough, we saw it across the night side. We looked before coronal mass ejection and we saw no emission. As soon as one hit, now we start seeing emission. And it's very short, just lasts for a couple days, or you know, data gets really noisy, and then you can't pick it out anymore. But we're only seeing the green from the oxygen. We do not see any other auroral colors, which is confusing, honestly, because we expect to see that. So that tells us, OK, we think this is coming from deeper in the atmosphere where you don't see other auroral emission. And that's all sorts of new chemistry that we can't do on Earth, and we can only observe it on another planet. We can't mimic this in a lab. But what we really need to see if this is coming from deeper in the atmosphere is another data set. And this is what we get from space-based observations from the wonderful, beautiful, lovely European Venus Express. It's our one orbiter around Venus. It has multiple instruments. We're using several of them. One in particular is we look at electron concentrations in the atmosphere. And so you can see in this plot that there are certain peaks. There's a peak at around 140, 145 kilometers in white. There's also a peak around 120, 125 in green. Now what happens is the peak in white is showing at around 140, 145. That's where you're getting the most electrons in the atmosphere. And it's electrons and protons impacting that give you aurora. Now when the observation was done for the white line, that was before coronal mass ejection impact. 
Two days later, we had an impact. That is the yellow line. And all of a sudden, you see those electrons are peaking about 20 kilometers lower down in the atmosphere, which is where we'd expect green emission without any other colors. And sure enough, we were doing ground-based observations at the same time, and we saw the green while the electrons were low. So now we're starting to come up with, OK, what's the chemistry that's occurring? What molecules are responsible? What atoms are responsible? And now we're using computer models to help simulate this. So the implications for this is it actually is possible, we're arguing, to have auroras on a non-magnetic planet. But it takes extreme events for this to occur. It might be a unique chemistry. Maybe there are some similarities to Earth, but there's a lot of differences. It takes these extreme conditions. Maybe this is something unique to Venus because of its thick CO2 atmosphere, because of its proximity to the sun. It's getting so much more charged particles. But maybe we can see this on Mars. It also has a CO2 atmosphere, though thinner. It's still pretty close to the sun, and it has no magnetic field of its own. There's a small one, but we're not going to say that. So we should in theory, be able to see it there, which is something that would be great if MAVEN could detect that, our new Mars mission. This would also have implications for extrasolar planets. If we start seeing certain auroral features without other auroral features, what does that tell us about the magnetic field? What does that tell us about the state of the star? Is it a flaring star, active star? So in summary, we've done ground and space-based observations of the Venus atmosphere. We're looking for this green auroral light. We see it most intensely after large solar storms, particularly charged particle storms. And so we're proposing that this is an aurora. And this opens up the possibility for aurora on other non-magnetic planets or even exoplanets. So, thank you. Well, I guess. <laughs> now I've done it. There's the reset button. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to be talking about a uh, main belt asteroid uh, that we discovered with a tail. Uh, this is work I've done with Chad Trujillo, who's at the Jim Observatory, and I'm Scott Shepard, who's at the Carnegie Institution for Science. So here you can actually see, uh, on this first image here, you can see a picture of the uh, of the comet, uh, the, the asteroid with the tail going down to its uh, to the to the left there. So the the main thing here is that we've been doing the largest and deepest solar system survey for uh, objects in the solar system, and this is with the CTI four meter telescope uh, down in Chile, which has recently been upgraded to have a three square degree imager on it, which is the largest uh, imager uh, CCD camera on a four meter or larger class telescope. So far, we've covered about 1,000 square degrees, which is about 5% of the, the interesting sky to over 24th magnitude. And uh, we had a, a big find a few months ago. Uh, so this is the outer solar system showing the perihelion distance versus eccentricity for all the objects known. Uh, you can see Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You can see where the Kuiper belt is, and you see this edge to the Kuiper belt at about 50 AU. Uh, and we found uh, this object, which was called 2012 VP113, or we nicknamed it Biden. Uh, it has the most distant orbit known in the solar system, and it never comes closer than ADAU. So that was one of the discoveries of this survey. Uh, this just shows the, uh, the orbit of Biden, VP113, compared to Sedna and the Kuiper Belt. So it's a very distant, uh, large orbit object. But in this survey, we're also uh, detecting other things, such as comets. So this is a pretty uh, obvious comet that was detected. Uh, it was a known comet, uh, and it's just, it's just obvious that it's a comet. But uh, we also detect things uh, like this. And so here you can see in the middle of the image, uh, this is three different images taken about an hour and a half apart. Uh, and you can see a bright object moving down. And that is uh, up until basically for the last 15 years, it's known as Main Belt Asteroid 62412. Uh, in this image, uh, you may or may not be able to see that there's a slight tail going uh, to the bottom of the object. Uh, but the thing is, our survey is going deeper than any other survey has ever gone for solar system objects. And so this is a very, very faint tail that is just barely detectable, that no other survey, all the other all-sky surveys are much shallower than, than what we do. And they would never detect a tail like this. So we're opening up an environment to the solar system that no one else has been able to observe before. So this was done with the 4-meter. And then once we noticed the tail, 
we went to the Magellan Telescope, which is 6.5 meter, and we got uh, better data, which uh, shows the tail much more uh, prominently. So the question is, uh, what makes a comet a comet? Um, is it just activity that you have to see? And so recently it's been uh, asteroids and comets, there's, there's been a, a very blurred line between what is an asteroid and what is a comet. And is there really a, a, much, that much of a difference to what they are? So generally we believe that comets come from the Oort cloud, which is this big spherical uh, cloud, uh, tens of thousands of AU from the solar system, from the, from the sun. Uh, so that's generally where the long period comets come from. The shorter period comets are believed to have come from the Kuiper belt, uh, which is a disk of uh, objects just beyond Neptune. And so these two reservoirs, the objects likely formed in the very outer parts of the solar system, uh, so they would have formed with a lot of ices. Uh, they would have been very cold throughout the whole history of them. And so that's the understanding of why those objects, when they get dislodged from the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt, they start showing the, the sublimation from the ices. But these objects uh, in the main asteroid belt, so this is a plot showing uh, the Sumerian axis versus eccentricity uh, of all the known objects uh, in the inner solar system. The, the black dots are all the main belt asteroids, and that's where the, the area is stable within our solar system. That's why the main belt asteroids are there. The red dots are objects that are known to be in families. So there's, in the asteroid belt, there's groups of, of objects, uh, and these are the red dots. In the upper right, you can see the, the green, uh, tri uh, green diamonds. Those are all the known short period comets. And uh, you see that there's uh, the purple dotted lines are basically where uh, Mars and Jupiter's orbits come. So if you're anywhere near those purple dotted lines, your orbit is, is unstable because you're interacting with, with those planets. So that's why all the comets are there. They came from the outer solar system and they're interacting with the planets and they're unstable. But the, there's 13 now known uh, cyan, the cyan circles there, which we we're calling active asteroids or main belt comets. And the big question is, uh, what are these objects and why are they showing activity? So the, the new one that we just found, a 62412, is shown here as, a, as the blue square in the lower right of this figure. And it's the first known uh, active asteroid in the Hygieia family uh, of, of asteroids. So all the family asteroids are shown here in red. And uh, this is the first one. The Themis family was known to have several already uh, in it. So the question is, the Hygieia family is two to three billion years old, so it's a very old, old family. Uh, and, and ices are unstable over the age of the solar system on these objects, at least on the surfaces. So the question is, why are they comet-like now? Why are they showing activity now? And so people have suggested that impacts could, uh, could uh, expose ices on the surfaces, uh, sublimation from these ices could do it, uh, possible rotational fission, uh, and there's various different uh, pr uh, ways to get this activity. So when we first observed this object, it was a year after its perihelion. So generally comets uh, would show activity near perihelion if they're ices, because that's when, when the object is the warmest. Um, we saw activity about a year after perihelion in March 2014. Uh, we saw the activity again in May 2014. Those are shown by the two uh, solid blue circles in the upper right. We got observations then in August 2014, and uh, we did not see activity on the object at that point, and that's why it's an open circle. We then went back into archive data uh, from the CFHT telescope and, saw, and found that uh, this object was observed twice, uh, just before perihelion and a year before perihelion, and uh, that did not show activity during that time either. So this object just became active after perihelion sometime uh, and showed activity for basically a short period of time. So we got the rotation period for this object uh, at the Magellan Telescope, and we found actually a very fast period. This is a 3.33 hour period. It's a double peak period, uh, meaning it's an elongated object. You can see uh, that for the, uh, for the very faint magnitudes, about 18.4, uh, the two peaks have different, uh, different amplitudes, and that shows that the object is an elongated, irregular shaped object. So the interesting thing, if you take this period uh, versus the amplitude, and you assume something about the object, you just assume it's a, it's a, a, a strengthless rubble pile type object. Uh, you, can, you can get a density for the object if you assume a critical period. The critical period is when the object starts rotating so fast that it basically breaks apart or stuff starts coming off the surface. And so we, we do that here with the period versus amplitude. Uh, and what we find is 62412 has the fastest known period of any object known in the Hygieia family. It also has the fastest known period of any object in the Themis family, which is also known to have several main belt comets. And we also plot on this graph comets, which have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, gr the, green, uh, the green the green points, and uh, they don't have any periods faster than about uh, six hours. 
And so the thing is that 62412 is the fastest known rotator of these objects. And 133P is also in the Themis family. It's also a, no, a known main belt comet. It has the second known fastest rotation of these objects. And both of them would have densities of about 1,500, uh, which is just above water. But much, they're much more dense than any of the comets, known comets would be. So these objects are, are fairly dense compared to comets, uh, and they're rotating very fast. So the, the main thing here is uh, rotational fission is important. So we now have uh, only a handful of these objects known, and uh, the ones that we have rotation periods for is basically we know three rotation periods for this handful of objects, and two of them have very, very fast rotations. So it suggests that uh, these objects are losing material off their surface from, uh, from spinning so fast that uh, they're basically fissioning material. Uh, and we suggest that uh, once objects start spinning really fast, they actually start changing their shapes, stuff starts shifting around on their surfaces, and this could be exposing ices as well. So we do not know yet if the rotational fission, if the material is coming directly off the surface, or if it's exposing ices underneath, which then can sublimate away and bring material off the surface. So that's, that's uh, yet to be determined. And just to, to finish off, uh, we have imaged about 15,000 main belt asteroids in our survey, uh, and we found one active asteroid. So if you do the statistics on that, uh, there's, this suggests there's probably about 100 of these objects in the main belt uh, at any one point in time. And this rotational fission is right, likely a very significant source of dust in the solar system. So generally, usually we think of dust in the solar system coming from, from uh, the asteroids colliding, impacting with each other, or from comets coming far in. Uh, sublimated away. But a third source is now becoming apparent, which uh, objects get, start rotating so fast that dust just flies off their surfaces. And this could be a very significant uh, source of the dust in our solar system. And uh, the final slide here is just uh, there has been, on the parent body of 62412, which would be 10 Hygieia, uh, there has been a, a three micron feature detected on this recently, which has been suggested as being a water ice feature, which it could be other things, it could be organics or some other feature, but it does suggest that uh, 62412 could be, have a significant amount of water ice in it, which could uh, argue for uh, sublimation being exposed through the fast rotation. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so having heard about the Venus and heard about another interesting comet, let me, let, let's now talk about another, another interesting comet that just fl flew past Mars uh, in three weeks ago. My name is Jian Yang Li, and I'm a research scientist at Planetary Science Institute. So I'm going to talk about a uh, Hubble observation of a uh, sighting spring when it, um, before it uh, passed Mars and also uh, when it passed Mars. So this graph um, animation, I don't know what, whether animation has worked, but uh, anyway, um, so this close flyby happened three weeks ago, so we are still analyzing the data. And this opportunity is very important for us because it's the first close-up imaging opportunity for a dynamically new comet. Um, also, we, we, will have, we had the opportunity to study the interaction between comet and Martian atmosphere. So uh, in order to, support, to study this comet and support these um, related uh, studies, we observed co comet sighting spring uh, four times total. And uh, three times early observations was done um, in late last year and early this year. And it, as you can see here, these are the images at the early epochs. And uh, in the bottom, that's the enhanced image to show the uh, features in the dust coma. And then during the encounter, we actually had uh, 15 orbits, a total of 15 Hubble orbits to look at the comet. And we covered um, from, uh, um, before in, uh, from 16 hours before encounter until uh, 20 hours after encounter, so a 40 hour total, um, total time baseline. And this time we used uh, many filters, like three filters for the dust and uh, three other filters for the gas. And at, what, you, what, you, what you are seeing here is uh, um, two um, dust images through two um, filters. So these are the some examples of the images. Now let me tell you about what we learned from this, um, from this data. So I'm going to focus on two aspects. One is the orientation of the nucleus rotation, uh, rotational axis. And the second is the ice in the coma. So from early three epoch of observations, we actually, um, you know, we saw these um, beautiful features in the dust coma. 
And from these features, we were able to determine their orientation in the in inertial space in the sky. And uh, the way we determine that is that um, you know from from each image, we can measure where this uh, feature point. Uh, in, in sky plane. And then uh, if you only have one image, you will not be able to know the 3D orientation of the feature. Now we have three epochs when the comet are at three different places, three, three different position in the sky. So by combining all these three uh, observations, we'll be able to determine their, the, the pointing of these features. Um, so this plot shows how we determine that and you know, when these three, when these curves cross at one point, that means there's one solution for this photo orientation of, of the jet. And then we have good solution for the northern, northern um, jet, which is right here. Uh, however, we don't have a good solution for the southern jet, which, is, or which are the three curves that you see in the bottom of the plot. So um, if, now if we assume that, you know, uh, if, since we don't see any change in the northern jet feature, we can assume that that one should be the rotational axis of this comet. And that jet, that jet comes from the northern, from the pole of this comet. So that, we can take that as a, um, one solution of the rotational pole. So um, now you're gonna ask, What's gonna, what is like when, it's, uh, when a comet is flying by, uh, fly, flew past Mars, and what do we see? Do we see the same jet features? So this is uh, one um, Mars, one image of comet during Mars encounter. Uh, this is the dust, and in the, the small um, inset is the original image. And the big one is the enhanced image to show you the, uh, the, the, the coma, any, coma, any feature in the coma. And I also mark the direction of the sun and the orbital velocity of the comet. As you can see that here we don't see any sharp features as we saw in earlier images. And all the features are diffuse and not well defined, but they are towards all the, the sunward direction. In the anti-sunward direction, uh, we think that's probably the enhancement due to the tail. Uh, now where, should, where is the northern feature? Where sh is the northern feature supposed to be in this image? It should be here, based on our calculation. And we don't see any feature there. So that means this jet is probably turned off. If we do the calculation based on the orientation that we determined from early images, we found that this orientation is actually away from the sun. So that makes sense because the source area is now in dark, permanently dark, and the source is now turned off. So this feature actually turn, turns off. And that, is, that's, that, that actually supports our solution for this pole. Um, so with the pole solution, what we can do is that we actually know the seasons on the comet. And that determines the, uh, um, the illumination condition and how the comet evolves you know, as it passes uh, into the inner, inner solar system and uh, past Mars. So what's plotted here is the uh, latitude of the sun uh, with the red line, and the blue line is the, um, is the, is the, the latitude of the Earth, you know, where we're looking at the comet. So um, the equinox on the comet happened um, around early, in early September. So that's when the comet, the, when the sun moves from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere, or from the hemisphere that has the active jet in the north to the other, the other hemisphere. So that's why we think they, uh, um, that's what caused the shutoff of the northern jet. And also this pole orientation can be used to explain the brightness evolution of this comet. Uh, on the left hand side, that is the uh, total brightness of the comet. Um, and the, the, all those symbols are the total brightness of the comet actually measured uh, from a lot of observatories by amateurs and by professional astronomers. And the line is the, J, is the predicted brightness by, uh, by JPL. And if you look at this figure, you can see that starting from early uh, September or maybe late October, uh, late, late uh, August, the comet actually, the brightness of comet starts to drop way below the prediction. And if you look at the right hand side, that's the same plot as in previous slide. Uh, the red line is the, is the solar latitude. And you can see that that actually, you know, the time that the comet started to drop in brightness coinc coincide with the, um, with the time that the sun crossed the, uh, um, the equator when the northern jet shuts off. So uh, we think this post solution explains the, the long term behavior of this comet. All right, um, so that's about the, uh, the pole orientation of this comet. And then next, I'm going to talk about the, the color in the dust, because this tells us something about the composition in the coma and also give a, uh, in, infer uh, something about the internal structure of this comet. So what we see um, about the color, on the, um, the, um, 
what you see here is the color slope. So we like to do slopes. We measure the, we take images in two different wavelengths and we measure how, you know, how steep the, 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 the change of the brightness of the comet is across these two filters, two wavelengths. And then we can calculate how uh, steep the slope is, or in other words, how red it is. And what's shown here is a, is a, a color of the comet of the, of the coma. And the blue color actually means the, the comet is relatively bluer, and the, um, the, the red color means it's redder. And you can see that inside, uh, at small distance from the nucleus, from the center, uh, the comet appears to be relatively bluer than, um, than uh, the coma at larger distance from the center. And also, uh, this is a sequence of three uh, color maps at different, at three uh, heliocentric distances. And you can see that the color, the overall color of this comet actually uh, is brightened, is, is uh, getting redder and redder as it moves closer to the sun. And uh, on the bottom plot, that is just a, a plot of the color as you go, move from the center of the comet outward. So this behavior is actually similar to what we saw earlier um, in, in another famous comet, Comet Ison. Um, and uh, back at that time, we thought the explanation is uh, existence of icy grains in the coma because ice appears to be bluer, relatively bluer, bluer than refractory dust. And if you have ice there as it retrieve from nucleus, it will sublim sublimate and that will make the coma appear to be bluer. And as a comet, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, redder. And as the comet moved closer to the sun, ice sublimated um, sooner, uh, faster and faster, so that makes the overall color to be redder. And also, if you look at look close to the center of these color maps, and also compare with the um, with the um, enhanced image of the of the of the inner coma, we can sort see some sort of a correlation between the jet activity and the, the the blue patch. That probably indicates that icy grains are actually driven out by this uh, enhanced outflow. Um, at outside of three AU, this activity is mostly driven by um, volatiles that are that sublimates at much lower temperature than water. For, um, here, uh, most likely CO2 or CO. So um, why is ice important? Well, that actually uh, related to a new view of, about water ice sublimation on comets. Previously, we thought water ice in comet, uh, water ice sublimates from the nucleus, and you know, it, as it, it leaves the comet, the nucleus, it's always gas in the gas, in gas phase. But now there are some new uh, view from, you know, particularly from uh, Harley deep impact flyby of Harley 2 in four years ago. And now we know that water ice can, can actually be ejected from nucleus as solid, and then these solid icy particles can sublimate in a coma. And, um, you know, starting from Harley 2, we also saw similar behavior um, as in, uh, in comet Ison, and now we saw the same, same thing in Siding Spring. So that seems to be, to, be to, to suggest this is a common uh, behavior for all the comets, like, you know, both uh, short period comets like, like comet Harley 2, and also dynamically new comet, you know, for those comets that comes into the inner solar system for the first time since their formation. And also, um, what else it tells us is that it's indicating that those ice particles and the dust particles in comets are probably are not like well together by uh, you know ice. They are like very loose aggregates. Both ice and dust particles. They're, both these components are very loose aggregates in cometary nuclei. And uh, you know when comet is uh, greater than three AU from the sun, uh, activity is driven by CO and CO two, and those are just uh, you know blast out dust, refractory dust, and also IEC dust altogether. And there's no like melt freeze cycle ever happen in comets because if that happened, then you know those ice uh, refractory dust will be glued together by those ice. So, okay. Um, so that's uh, my summary. We had uh, Hubble observations, um, or both in or both, both way before the comet uh, flew past Mars, and uh, during the Mars encounter. And uh, I talked about two things: the rotational axis. Um, uh, and also the color of the uh, ice, uh, color of the coma, that, in, that indicates the ice in the coma. Um, so that's all I have to tell you, and with that, I will um, give it to the next speaker.
All right, my name is Kean Ryan. I'm an undergrad at Caltech, and my research is on binary planets. So in a typical planetary system, we have a central star and a planet orbiting that star, and occasionally orbiting around that planet, we have a satellite. A good example of this is the sun, the earth, and the moon. Now imagine if we took the moon and we scaled it up so it was the size of the earth. This is a binary planet system. Now, no such systems have been observed, but that doesn't mean they can't exist. Our simulations show that given certain conditions, it may be possible that binary systems will form. So we decided to look at early impacts and impacts between bodies of roughly Earth mass at a distance of roughly one AU. We chose to look at these because we know that these impacts already occur because this is how planets are formed. So we simulated these impacts using a technique known as smooth particle hydrodynamics, or SPH. And SPH has previously been used to analyze uh, scenarios such as the formation of the moon under the, uh, the great impact hypothesis and the formation of Pluto and Charon. So by using the simulation technique, we can set certain initial parameters and we can see how the system evolves and see if we have a binary system at the end. In particular, we're looking at the velocity at infinity and the impact parameter. The impact parameter is zero for a head-on collision and one for a very grazing collision. Now, if we run the simulations for the parameters as described, we'll get one of two outcomes. Either the bodies will have too much energy and they will interact, but have too much energy will not become bound and they will escape to infinity, or the bodies will collide, they will dissipate a large amount of energy and they will merge together to form a large central body with possible spiral arms to carry away excess angular momentum. So this matches well with the outcomes of simulations done by other researchers. But this isn't binary planets, so this isn't quite what we're looking for. So in order to find a binary planet, we have to expand our definition a little bit more. If we consider impact parameters of greater than one, this is something that it would look like. And this is, uh, and we can use this and simulate, and this is what we get. So as we can see, the bodies come in, and although they are separated so it doesn't look like they touch completely, they are still interacting and they're still dissipating energy. And as they continue interacting, they continue dissipating energy until they end up in this binary state. So what happens after this point? Well, we no longer need SPH calculations to figure out what happens, and we can actually figure this out analytically. So the next uh, event to occur is these two bodies become tidally locked. And after that, the uh, tidal forces from the central star will extract angular momentum from the system, causing the two bodies to go closer and closer together until they merge. Uh, this event takes on the order of one to 10 billion years for two roughly Earth-sized bodies at a distance of about one AU. Unfortunately, this scales with the sixth power of the distance to the central star, so by decreasing the distance of the central star, we are vastly decreasing the amount of time it takes to merge. So now that we can run SPH simulations, we can test these for different parameters and different pairs of velocity at infinity and impact parameter, and we come up with the following plot. Now the colored dots indicate the outcomes of simulations that we ran, and the colored regions are there to suggest possible boundaries between the regions that lead to binaries, large central bodies, and escape. So this chart is just a small piece of a larger picture. And although it is small, it is not insignificant. And we can see that there is definitely a region where if the initial conditions are within this region, we will get a binary system. So at this point, we have some uh, future concerns. Uh, another parameter that we want to look at is what happens when we change the masses or the mass ratios. Will we see the same behavior if we collide to Mars-sized bodies? Will we see the same behavior if we collide a Mars-sized body with an Earth-sized body? Due to the length of time it takes to run simulations, we haven't been able to run those yet, but those are simulations that we wish to run in the future. We also want to answer the question of how frequently would binaries occur? Unfortunately, we don't have a hard number for that yet. This is, there are a couple reasons uh, why we don't have that. So if we remember the chart of which regions led to binary planets. It depended on the impact parameter and the velocity at infinity. Now for the impact parameter, it's good news. 
Impact parameters that are higher are more likely than impact parameters which are lower. But for the velocity at infinity, there is no consensus on what a typical velocity at infinity is. So without knowing that number, we can't give a good answer for how frequently we expect binaries to occur. Another question to think about is if it's possible to detect binary exoplanets. Uh, this is possibly achievable through transit methods or microlensing uh, and is definitely an area for future research. Now that we've shown that certain conditions lead to binary planets, it might be time to start looking for them. So in conclusion, given a certain set of initial conditions, certain pairs will lead to binary systems. There's still more work that needs to be done to determine exactly how likely this will happen and exactly in what cases this will happen, but we know that these cases exist. So in conclusion, although in certain situations forming a binary system is improbable, it is not impossible. Thank you. All right, we'll open up uh, for questions. Uh, please state your name and uh, affiliation. Oh, Rick is waiting for the mic. All right, we can start from the right. Hi, Chris Crockett, Science News. Uh, Keegan, I was wondering, um, can you work backwards, given that we don't see any binary planets in our solar system? Can that tell us something about the conditions in the early solar system, like the velocities at infinity you were mentioning? Well, another factor that impacts whether or not we see binaries is how long they exist. So as I was saying, with uh, the length of time that these binaries exist goes with the sixth power of the distance to the central star. So since many of the objects observed orbiting foreign stars are very close, that would mean if there had been a binary at that distance at some point, it would have merged very quickly and we would have been unlikely to see it. So perhaps the fact that we haven't seen any could attest to the fact that we're just seeing objects that are very close to their central stars and not that, uh, not necessarily anything about the velocity at infinity. Okay. Uh, Don. So, um, I don't know if this is for Candace or uh, uh, Dr. Svetin. Um, the first uh, talk, you said that the magnetic field uh, is still under study at Venus. Your talk seemed to say that it, there wasn't one. Uh, how would the results that are still hanging sort of affect what you found? Uh, I mean, would that change things if there is a stronger field there? And I wonder, if, I wonder if the first speaker might have a comment on your results just in light of all that as well. So the quick answer I can give is that I didn't want to go into too much detail about the Venusian magnetic field. It does have an induced field as far as we know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it does not have one of its own. So it doesn't have its own magnetic field within the planet where those field lines come out of the planet. What you have instead is the solar wind, which are the charged particles from the sun. You could think of it like water down a river, and as it hits a stone, it wraps around it. And now this is a teardrop magnetic field that goes around Venus. And what I think might actually be happening is when you have these extreme solar events, these coronal mass ejections, it gets so intense that when it hits and it wraps around, it pinches it, and you can drive plasma back to the night side. It's called a magnetic reconnection, and we actually get them on Earth and produces large auroras. I just didn't want to touch on that in the talk. So, okay. so to comment on that from the, from the interior field, we haven't seen any uh, direct evidence of that, but uh, we don't really understand why there is no magnetic field. So we are limited in uh, the detections because we have the orbit which is far, far enough from, from the surface of Venus that uh, the field we measure is totally dominated by the induced magnetic field, as I kind of just mentioned. But uh, if we go close enough to the surface, we may be able to pick up some uh, parts of the interior field if there would be one. So that's what we were looking for. Okay, Leslie. Leslie Sage, Nature. Uh, for Candace, um, if you integrate the energy deposition uh, on the Venus night side and compare it to the energy deposited in the north and south poles of the Earth, um, is it comparable after scaling for inverse distance squared. And, um, and also, I'd like to know um, 
if you have any thoughts about why you're not seeing nitrogen fluorescence. So for the energy deposition, it's one of the things we're currently looking at with Venus Express. We're trying to get specific coronal mass ejection impacts and looking at the electron energies and their densities. And while we see an increase, I have to admit I have not compared it to Earth's. Um, I would imagine off the top of my head it would be much less just because you're not having that magnetic field concentrate everything down into a small area on the poles like you have for Earth. So I would imagine it's much smaller, although off the top of my head I couldn't tell you how small. Uh, I would get a nitrogen question. So this is something we've looked into because one of the strong auroral features on Earth is nitrogen, and that's how you say, okay, we have aurora, we have these nitrogen emissions. We've looked for it. So far we haven't seen it. To not go into too much detail, you have auroral lines that have very short lifetimes, where if something impacts an oxygen atom, it's very quickly going to release light. There are other times where it's going to take a very long time, and it depends on what emission line you're looking at, whether it's a 5577 green line, 6300 red line. They have different lifetimes. We're not seeing the long lifetime emissions, which makes us think these are very short, they're deeper in the atmosphere, but there's one nitrogen line that has a very nice short lifetime that we should see it, we think, if this is true aurora. Unfortunately, that falls right in the middle of a very nice large Fraunhofer line. And so these are absorption lines in the sun, and if I'm trying to look for an emission line in something that's being absorbed out, I can't see it. So it unfortunately falls in a bad part of the spectrum, and I've been trying to pull it out to see if we can see emission from nitrogen, and so far we just haven't seen it. Jim Cornell, freelance. Uh, this is for Keegan Ryan. Uh, this is very speculative because you haven't seen such a system before. But would one planet dominate in this, or would they both be the same uh, in their conditions? Yeah, so that's one of the goals for the future research and why we want to test it with different mass initial planets. Uh, the cases that we studied had a symmetric origin, so we had two bodies of identical mass uh, colliding in an identical way. So we expect the outcome to become or to be identical, and we expect the bodies to be balanced. It's, since we haven't run the simulations yet, it's unclear that if we change the mass ratio to no longer be one-to-one, -one, if that would cause one planet to dominate over the other. So that's one thing that we're hoping to study. Okay. Just go from left to right. <laughs> uh, Lesson Sage Nature for Scott. Um, so you can calculate pretty well the, um, the flux of material that's ejected from the rapidly spinning asteroid, right? So uh, if, you, if you look at what's exposed, then is that consistent with the flux rate of uh, ice off of the asteroid? Uh, so you're just talking about uh, what would we be, uh, are, you, are you interested in the water ice uh, sublimation or? Uh, yeah, to give your tail. Yeah. So, so is the, is the flux of material that you see on the tail consistent with what you would get exposed by a rapidly spinning asteroid? Yeah, I mean, uh, there should be uh, stuff under just uh, centimeters under the surface or so like that. And uh, I mean, this was, we, this, for this particular object, we only observed it uh, probably turned on much earlier than we observed it. But uh, we have to do the, the complete uh, dynamical calculation of how much material is coming off of that. We have yet to do that. But uh, there should be, uh, exposing stuff within a few centimeters. Is but you haven't done the calculation yet. But that calculation is being done, yeah. We haven't finished that. Dan Vergano from National Geographic. Sorry for not identifying myself the first time. Uh, I wondered uh, for Jian Yang if you could say a little bit more about Comet Siding Spring. There was a lot of discussion about it being a, a good example of an Oort Cloud Comet uh, that seems to have held up. Could you elaborate? I mean, what is this going to tell us about these guys? Yes. Um, so, so um, the, the the uniqueness of this comet is because you know first of all it's a dynamically new comet. It's a different category of the of the short period comet that has been visited by spacecraft. 
so far we have we had uh, like four short period. I mean plus uh, plus uh, 67 p c g by Rosetta. But those are all like um, short period comments, and uh, we all know that those flyby missions have fundamentally re revolutionized my our understanding about comets. You know, give us very close up imaging of the comet and study the like internal structures, uh, um, how the surface evolves. But we don't have this opportunity for dynamically new comets at all. Just you know, just because one they they you know, we we can we could only um, discover them like one or two two years at most before their um, perihelion passage. So we don't have much time. And then once they are gone, they're gone. They'll never come back. So that's the main difficulty for study dynamically new comet. But on the other hand, we know that these two diff two category of comets they are different. Um, they could be you know, they could have different like compositions or formation uh, regions. Although you know the recent dynamic dynamical models make make things a mess. But basically, um, these two are very different comets. Two category of comets just in terms of their dynamical history. And uh, um, dynamic new comets, they are thrown out to the outer solar system, to the old cloud, very soon after their formation, you know, by these giant planets, the scattering mechanism. And uh, um, so they, in this sense, they are relatively fresh than, um, than short period comets, which are, which have repeatedly come close to the sun and be baked many, many times. So that's why, why we care dynamic new comets. And for sighting spring, it, um, is close flyby with Mars that um, enable the high-rise camera on board MRO to image it uh, at a pixel scale of 140 meters per pixel. And uh, if you went to yesterday's session, uh, you, I think you, you, you would have seen the images by high-rise, although it's still kind of disappointing because the comet is too small. Uh, we had hoped it to be bigger. But still, um, that's going to tell us, tell us, those images are still going to tell us a lot of uh, information about these new category comments. And, you know, what I'm thinking is that from this new data, we might be able to um, get some, like, pilot um, knowledge about these whole new category comments. So we want to know what are the future directions for studying these category of comments. Maybe that's going to give us some clue about how to do a future mission to uh, new comments. And uh, we had so much data in hand now, you know, both from Mars spacecraft and from uh, Hubble, and also from other, a lot of other ground-based observers. So the analysis is still going on. We only had three weeks of time before we come here and talk to you. So stay tuned. Okay. Chris, you had a question? Okay. Hi, Chris Crockett, Science News. This question is for Scott. Um, you may have mentioned this, and I may have missed it, but has anyone been able to obtain spectra of specifically the tails of any of these active asteroids, and can that help uh, us understand what's, what's, driving these, what's driving the activity? Yeah, so people, people have attempted to, to look at these objects uh, looking for water ice or looking for a CN or some kind of volatiles, and so far there's been no direct detection of any volatiles. So uh, it's only inferred due to some of them turning on near perihelion uh, for the volatiles, uh, and uh, and how you can tell if it's an impact or or sublimation because impacts uh, basically get bright really fast and they fade really fast, and where some of these objects seem to be uh, emitting material for long periods of time, which would be more likely to be uh, through volatiles or or the rotation thing. That the problem with the rotation is most of these objects are very faint, and so people uh, have not got rotations to date, uh, whereas this object that we just found is uh, one of the brighter ones and it was easier to get the, the rotation period for it. Okay, we have a few questions online. Yes, we have a few questions from online. So this first one, <clears throat> excuse me, is from Alex Witza, who's uh, writing for Nature. It's for Zhang Yang Li. Um, how does the rate of dust production that you saw in the siding spring up to and during the encounter match with the earlier estimates of the impact hazard to the Mars spacecraft? Uh, put another way, uh, did NASA really need to move their spacecraft out of harm's way? Well, uh, within a factor of two. That's like a standard answer. But um, yes, uh, we, did, did, we did do a very quick estimate for the dust production rate from the Hubble images uh, for, during the close encounter. And uh, it is actually, um, 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 I would say, um, Lower than or a little bit lower than or than the, pre than the previous prediction, but you know comets are very hard to predict. Every, everybody knows that, so so I would say we did a pretty good job, 
And in terms of uh, the, the um, moving spacecraft to the backside of Mars, you know, uh, I'm not the, the one of the modelers who did the original modeling for those, uh, you know, to predict how much dust are going to be there. Um, but from my conversation with my colleagues who did this, um, basically, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, of course, the, um, I think what I said is that the, um, um, from ground-based observation from Hubble, uh, everything is just like predicted. But on the other hand, some Mars spacecraft team like MAVEN, I think they also reported some kind of uh, high impact flux on their instrument. This is what I heard. And, uh, um, but they're still working on it. This, this, this is a very strange, they don't understand it yet, whether it's coming from the comet or it's just some kind of background flux, you know. So, uh, but uh, um, it's still kind of puzzling and uh, I, I cannot say too much about it. Okay, um, related to that also for you, um, the images that were posted on, uh, with your press release are not exactly from the encounter. They're very nice Hubble images of the comet, but not from the encounter. Are the encounter uh, images going to be released? Uh, so far from the Space Telescope, they've only put out one picture. Um, the images you saw are in, in from space, space, space Telescope, I mean, from the, their public release, that is, that's actually a composite image uh, based on the com image of the comet uh, that's actual image of the comet taken during the encounter and the actual image of Mars during the encounter. And they, they just put them together because they cannot, we, we, they, you cannot just take an image uh, of the comet and the Mars together at the same time. They are, um, you know, the comet and Mars are close enough for, for us to take image. I mean, they could be, they could fit in one field of view, but their, their brightness, there are two reasons that we could not do that. One is the, that their brightness are very different. Mars is much, much brighter, like 10 magnitude brighter than, than, than the comet. And then second is that they are moving in different directions in the sky. So we cannot track, you cannot do, a, you, if you track one, you're gonna smear the other. Okay, this question is from Marcus Wu at Caltech for Candace Gray. What is the hypothetical physical and chemical process that would produce the observed green emission? Also, what did people think the emission was if it wasn't aurora? So it was initially thought to be night glow. And on Earth, you get night glow. It's low in the atmosphere. It's everywhere to the bane of ground-based observers because you always have to account for it. But the chemistry of night glow is different than the chemistry of aurora. And this is due to the altitude difference, the fact that electrons aren't penetrating as low for night glow. The chemistry for Earth's aurora is mostly O2 ions combining with electrons. So you'll have your two oxygen atoms combined. They grab an electron and they break up. And now they have some energy and they can release the light. And this is done high in the atmosphere. But as you step down, you start getting into lower ionospheric regions. One of the possibilities is nitric oxide ions. So you have a nitrogen and an oxygen bonded. When it grabs an electron, it splits and one of the, or the oxygen, can emit green light. But this, while it was mentioned in a paper by Fox in 2012, it wasn't really followed up on because in order for this to happen, it has to be deeper in the atmosphere, and it has to be higher energy electrons, which of course was just brushed off because how are you going to get them there? They would be completely dispersed in the upper atmosphere. So what we are proposing with a publication to be submitted soon is you can get this when a CME impacts. And now all of a sudden you have all these high energy charged particles, whether they're electrons, protons, helium, hydrogen, nuclei that initiate it, we're not sure. But that would get higher energy electrons deeper in the atmosphere and this reaction might then be possible and you produce lots of nitrogen, but most of it isn't the state that emits the auroral light. So if this happens, we wouldn't see oxygen red line, we wouldn't see nitrogen lines, we wouldn't see any of the auroral lines except the green line. And so we're proposing it's nitric oxide, but why we're not getting emission from oxygen molecules, we don't know. So okay. we're still looking into that. Okay, and I have a question for Scott Shepard. Um, again, this is Rick Feinberg, AAS press officer. Uh, you mentioned that when you look at these active 
main belt asteroids that they tend to be spinning very rapidly. Uh, does that suggest that if you were to monitor other asteroids that are known to spin particularly rapidly, that you might pick up some activity at various points around their orbit, in particular near perihelion? Yeah, it's a really good question. So when we discovered this object, there was only uh, one known main belt asteroid, a uh, main belt comet that had a rapid rotation, because only, only two of them had been measured. So the moment we saw it, this one had a rapid rotation, it became obvious that what you said is true. So we're actually now doing a survey, I just came back from Chile uh, two weeks ago, where we were looking at everything that we know that's spinning fast, and looking to see if they have tails or coma around them. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're doing that survey now by, uh, by hoping to find something that's uh, spinning fast and showing a tail. What, what period defines fast? Is it uh, so, I mean, we start with the fastest ones that are like in the two hour, high two hour ranges, the low three hour ranges, but uh, anything spinning uh, faster than four hours is on our list. Okay, if there are no questions, I, you have a question, Chris? Oh, sorry, no. Hi, I'm still Chris Crockett from Science News. Um, this question's for Candace. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, possible detection uh, for exoplanets. Yes. Um, can you comment a little bit on just how difficult <laughs> a, a measurement that would be? What would be required in terms of instrumentation? And how would, might that complement other observations of exoplanet atmospheres, say, you know, transit spectrum? Currently, it would be impossible. Uh, we actually looked into this of whether or not we could do it with current observations. And looking at, so the way you'd have to do this is if you have your exoplanet away from the star and you took a spectrum of it. And if it was, you have your star, you have your planet, and I'm observing from Earth, I'm seeing the night side of that planet. So then I could see the aurora. And then we would compare it to observations when it's on the other side of the star, and now we see it's day side. And you subtract out those two spectra, and you can see what is it emitting on the night side. Now, if you would, were to see this oxygen green line, is that night glow? Is that aurora? Wouldn't be sure. Maybe if you saw some other auroral features, then you can say, hey, this planet exhibits some auroral activity. Maybe it has a magnetic field that shows that its star is possibly very active, sending out flares and CMEs that just can't be registered from these distances. But looking at the flux that you would get, the amount of light that could be measured, right now we can't do it with our current instruments. But in maybe a decade, a couple decades, maybe that'll be possible. OK, one last question. Sure. For Dr. Spedman. Uh, obviously, you were successful, but was there ever a moment when you thought that your spacecraft would not survive this exercise and aero braking? Yeah, it was quite much debated before we, before we started uh, to what level we should go. And, and, and some people thought we shouldn't go more to that level what other spacecraft have done in the past. But I was qu pushing quite strongly to really stress it more because we want to learn something and we will also get more. Uh, information from the deeper atmosphere then. So, so there were people that thought it would not survive, but we did. Okay, do you have questions? Oh, Leslie. Yeah, okay. So th this is a trivial one for you, Hakan. Um, what was the orientation of the solar panels as you uh, went through the atmosphere? That was with the, the side with the the un, not the side with the solar cells, but the back side, so to say, were flat out against the atmosphere. So we maximized the drag that way. Okay. If you, one more question online. Yeah, this is from uh, freelance writer Jeff Hecht. Um, it's for Keegan. Um, he's asking, how close do the two planets have to come to form a binary? You described impact parameter and velocity, but uh, you know, how physically close do they have to come? Do they actually have to crash, and is it just the angle at which they collide? Yeah, so when uh, the velocity at infinity is roughly zero, we got binary systems that formed when the bodies were separated by probably between two to five planet radii, so around that range. So they don't actually, they don't necessarily collide? Uh, not necessarily. They do deform quite a bit, and uh, parts of them do get very close, and they're they can be considered sort of kissing collisions where parts of the planets come together. 
but the centers of the planets are roughly separated by that amount. And then I have a question for you. Um, at what point do the simulations that you're doing begin to raise questions or provide some answers to the simulations that are being done to figure out how we got our moon? Uh, so, entirely different simulations. Like, ours are running for uh, on the order of probably a few hundred hours of real time. And those are, I, I believe, run on shorter time scales, although I'm not an expert in that. Okay. So, you have a question? Yeah. One last one, sorry. This is the reverse of Jeff Heck's question. Uh, how close do they have to be before, or how, what's the distance before they start ripping themselves apart after they become a binary system? Is there uh, a maximum or minimum? You know? uh, what do you mean by ripping themselves apart? Well, wouldn't the tidal forces, like moon and earth, but in the, where you've got two equal sized bodies close together, wouldn't they rip themselves apart at some point? Uh, we didn't observe that in the simulations that we ran. We got some cases where the bodies ended up in a binary system where they were very, very close together and hardly separated at all, and they were still functioning as binary and separate planets. So there's no minimum distance in which uh, danger zone, I guess. Not that we observed. Okay, that we conclude. I have a few announcements. Please do not applaud. And uh, if, uh, for the members of the media and on the panel, I have lunch coupons. So thank you, and we will see you tomorrow.